Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here from wherever you are. My name is Ronnie Rios. I'm the product manager here at Claris, and I'm really excited to be your host for today's webinar on AI integrations in FileMaker Solutions. I'm joined today by three Claris partners and community leaders, all of whom recently delivered unique sessions at Claris Engage on this topic of the potential of AI integrations in FileMaker. Now let's welcome Chris Ippolite from iSolutions, Ernest Coe from Proofgeist, and Yoris Arts from, Claris, from Clickworks. Now, during Claris Engage, we gave a sneak peek at some of the things that we're exploring here at Claris on how to make it even easier for you to leverage AI in your FileMaker solutions. However, everything that we're gonna be talking about today can be achieved with FileMaker 2023. Our hope is that by the end of this session, you'll have you know, enough information to think about how you might go about leveraging AI, both in your development and also in the delivery of new user experiences in your custom apps. So the format for today's webinar is going to be, we'll have first a demonstration from each one of the panelists. They'll cover a kind of a condensed version of what they presented at Claris Engage. And we'll follow up with a roundtable discussion. And finally, we'll open it up to answer questions live with the remaining time that we'll have. So with that, let's kick it off and um, hand it over to Chris Ippolite. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Ronnie. I'm Chris Ippolite from iSolutions, and I'd like to show you a real-world example of combining machine learning and language models together into one use case. Now, often machine learning and language models are kind of confused, maybe even thought of as the same thing, but here's a real life customer deployment that combines both types of models together into one simple use case, which I think helps show what types of tasks each model are best used for. So first of all, to kind of set up what our client is using both of these models for, you'll see that what we've created here is a custom FileMaker application that is intended to create estimates that can be converted into jobs. Now, the estimating process starts when a salesperson enters in natural language descriptions of what the job needs to be that you see here. Like they could be talking to the customer on the phone and they're really just dictating what it is that the customer wants using a little bit of shorthand. Then ultimately what happens is that another user will come in, interpret the description that was entered by the salesperson, and then create these line items in the portal that you see below. Now, the way that that human does that is based on a bunch of training and business rules that they've been given, and they turn keywords that they see in the description into individual line items or job codes down here in this portal. So what we're doing is using language models to apply those same rules to the text that's in the description field, and then create the estimate line items automatically. Then we use a machine learning model to create more efficient line item estimates or to make them closer to what their actuals would eventually be in a job. So let's take a look at how we created the language model portion of this. So first, we start off working with subject matter experts to understand and then document the rules that they're applying when they are reading the values in the description field and then manually turning those into estimate line items in the portal below. These are business rules that map keywords like preflight into a specific code or job code like GST-008. Then we create a data dictionary of those keywords and job code pairs that map these preflight and GST-008 values. And then in FileMaker, we create a function that contains those same keyword and job code pairs. Then in FileMaker, when we are specifying the curl request inside the insert from URL script step that we're using to execute the API call to the language model, we combine those pairs along with the instruction and the data from the descriptions field into what we call a prompt template. Then we send all of this information over to the language model via an API call, and then eventually receive back what the line items are gonna need to be. This is what an example of the output from the API looks like. And then we parse all the data based on the rules that were established in the data dictionary. We then use native FileMaker JSON functions to parse the data out of the returning JSON into the related estimate line item records and fields. So at this point, what we've done is successfully convert the description in natural language into line items based on the rules that were given to us in the data dictionary. Next, inside the application, those estimate line items that were returned by the language model become inputs for a custom machine learning model that we created. So let's take a look at how we created that machine learning model. First, we trained the model with data from 778 estimate records. All of them were estimates that later became jobs. Then, 
In each of the corresponding jobs that those estimates were converted into, we took 1168 columns, each as an individual job code, and trained our model to convert estimated line items into the most probable job codes based on those historical estimates. And because FileMaker has native support for CoreML, we decided to create the model to run in CoreML. And when you're creating a CoreML model, you can either use the command line or you can use this tool that comes with Xcode and it's called CreateML. I selected the linear regression option when I set up the CreateML project, which allows us to create a general model that we can then use within FileMaker. Now using the CreateML tool, we first feed it training data, then testing data, which is a subset of the training data. We choose the target field or fields, which are all the fields we want to populate with our model output, along with the features, which are the fields that contain the historical data we're using to train the model. Then CreateML does the model training and valuation until it finally creates an output. You can then save the model as a .ml model file, and this file then gets placed in a container field in the FileMaker solution, and it is run with a combination of the configure machine learning model script step and the compute model calculation function to parse out and consume the model target field outputs and their confidence values. And when you put all of these things together, you can create a new job, enter in the natural language description, and then the language model will convert that into line items automatically. The user will then add some quantities, and now the machine learning model evaluates those line items and quantities and says, no, actually, these are going to be the line items and quantities that will match the job more effectively, thus increasing the profitability of the project by simply inserting these two models into the process. And now I'll hand off to Ernest. A powerful thing you can do today with your FileMaker databases and AI is to add a capability called semantic search. Now, semantic search is a AI and LLM enabled search capability that allows users to query your databases not on specific keywords and syntax alone, but on um, meaning, context, and some nuance. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of what this looks like. Autoflix is a uh, FileMaker app, a native FileMaker app that has a built-in AI system designed to let us do some pretty cool things with a movie database. So in my movie database, I have about 45,000 records consisting of uh, all different types of movies and metadata about those movies, as well as description and other um, interesting details like ratings and release dates and whatnot that are stored in here. So let's see what I can do with our little um, AI assistant. Uh, let's start with some basic questions. Uh, who are you? Hello, I'm your AI assistant for Autoflix. I'm here to help you find information about movies. Answer. All right, that's very cool. Well, let's ask it some questions about the recent Oscars, shall we? Um, who is Christopher Nolan? Let's see what it knows about him. <clears throat> Christopher Nolan is a prominent English film director, producer, and screenwriter. He is well known for his intricate... Oh, that's very cool, but I know that Christopher Nolan directed Oppenheimer, so maybe we can ask Autoflix if their movies related to Oppenheimer in our catalog. Uh, it's a related uh, about Oppenheimer. How's that? Here are the top five results in the Autoflix catalog. Infinity October Sky the Manhattan Project the day after Trinity nukes in space. Now that's very interesting. So let's take a look at the results. Richard Feynman. Manhattan Project. Day of the Trinity. Nukes in space. So as you can see here, that the power of this AI system is that it's not strictly just looking for keywords like Oppenheimer. It's actually looking at the context of the search and giving me results that were related to uh, the inquiry that I had um, put in. 
So what's happening behind the scenes is that we're taking all this data that we have in our farming databases and we're hitting the um, OpenAI LLM to generate some vector embeddings, which will then give us a way of chunking these uh, texts that we have in our Pharmaca database and storing it in such a way that allows us to compare similarities between uh, sentences and paragraphs and words instead of just about characters and strings in this traditional fast text search format. So as you can see here, one example of this is if I had a sentence that says the Westminster Dog Show and I had a similar sentence about uh, such as movies about cats and dogs doing awesome things, those two sentences are more similar to each other than say Gordon Ramsay's hot dog recipe, even though all these things mention dogs in them. So that's the uh, quick, really high level uh, preview of what you can do with semantic search and a quick uh, primer on what's going on. Thank you. Um, two examples of what I call smart apps. First one is a demo file, um, business card reader, and the second one is a project we are doing with a client, uh, a benchmarking tool. Um, a business card scanner is available for free on our website, clickworks.eu, and we use FindMaker Go with a built-in live text feature to capture uh, text from a business card. We send that text to a large language model, in this case, uh, ChatGPT 3.5, and it returns us, it parses the information on the business card. And it does a pretty good job in recognizing first names, last names, address information, and so on. Let me show you. Here we go. So there's a, a locked file which includes our API key that allows you to test it for free. And you can unlock it and then use your own API key and look at our script. So this is just a contact and company database. But the new thing is I can add new contacts just by snapping a picture of their business card. And so you can try this app up to 20 times um, on our account. So I'm going to hit the scan button and use the trial API key um, to scan a business card. Here we go. I have a business card here. And so this is built in uh, iOS functionality. So taking a picture and then using live text. And so this is the result from, from the AI. It has parsed out first name, last name, even in Dutch. This, this works great. And it has split company and contact information. So it retrieves address, postal code, and so on, and contact information like email, telephone, uh, etc. So this saves me a lot of time. If I'm on a conference, I receive business cards. I can just scan them instead of manually typing them. Now to unlock this file, it will close the uh, secured file and it will open an unlocked version of the same file. But now you need your own API key, of course. So register your API key, uh, in this case with openai.com. Just paste it here. There's a little uh, test to check if that API key is working. Yeah, it's working. And so just showing again that with the new API key, this works as well. So just scanning the same business card again. And there we go. So this little app is available for free on our website and you can just see how we build it and what scripts we used, etc. So that's a first little example and the instruction set uh, for OpenAI is actually very simple. These are the only instructions we are giving. Like try to extract this information, uh, a list of field names, and we ask it to return us information in a structured way. So to deliver a JSON string with the uh, required information. And then two additional instructions about constructing website URLs and uh, returning country codes. That's all. And the most important thing is that we provided an example. And that's how we kind of train the AI um, to learn what input it can expect and what output we do expect. And so uh, the fact that we are receiving a structured text back 
helps us tremendously in building a script that can then write that information to the appropriate fields. So that's the only thing happening there. So it's actually a pretty simple API integration. Now the second example I have is a real world uh, use case scenario. We are working with a client um, that's active in the uh, financial um, industry and they do what they call benchmarking. And uh, without going too deep into it, from what I understand is uh, they extract a list of companies um, for a benchmarking assignment. That's typically a list of like a hundred companies in each benchmark. These are already selected based on financial criteria. Uh, and now they need to reduce that set further to uh, a representative sample set of companies from about, uh, for about 20, 30 companies. And that further elimination is based on um, a list of questions. Uh, and they typically hire a team of researchers that browse the websites of those companies uh, and answer those questions. And this process used to take weeks to complete for one benchmarking assignment. Now, with AI, they want to do that partly um, automatic, and they expect to reduce that labor of weeks to a couple of days. So what we are going to do is download uh, the website content or scrape the website content, but only for research purposes. Uh, and then we feed that text to the AI together with a list of elimination questions. Um, and that should help to reduce that set of companies based on the content of their website. Um, let me show you how this works. I have a little demo uh, here, so I'm going to run that demo. So you see the benchmarking assignment record with, to the left, the list of companies that's still included. We need to eliminate, reduce that list further by looking at the website of each company. So this is an example of a typical company website and so what we do is we use a service to scrape a part of that company website and the challenge there is to keep only uh, useful representative information there's a lot of clutter of course uh, on that website as well once we have that content we can use AI to ask questions and to deliver us answers with a certain degree of certainty and this will help us to reduce that company list to only uh, a list of sample companies that are representative for what we are looking for so let me run one of those questions now live i'm going to hit the process next question button this is now really happening so we're transferring website content and in a couple of seconds we get the answer to this particular question back with a certain level of certainty it can conclude that this company delivers what we are looking so that's basically the application we are building. We are still in the exploration testing phase, but so far it looks, it looks very, very promising. So these two examples, that's what I had um, in terms of real world AI use cases. Thank you very much. Well, Welcome everyone, once again, thank you so much. Uh, yours, that was really fantastic. All of you, uh, your demos are really, uh, really great. I think uh, I speak from uh, uh, everyone here, uh, that content was really amazing. I think it's just a sneak peek of some of the things that you guys were presenting uh, just previously here at, at Engage. And uh, I saw all of, all of your presentations were just really fantastic. I think it really shows how you, know, you can really leverage AI in FileMaker solutions today, and some really amazing uh, experiences you can bring uh, with it. So I'd like to start, we'll kick off here the conversation. Like I said, we'll we'll uh, have a quick conversation here among us. So there's some things that I think the audience is thinking about here as well, but then we'll open it up for live Q&A. But one of the things that that I think, uh, I, you know, kind of really uh, comes to mind here that I wanted to to get your, your thoughts is, you know, uh, you're all exploring with AI in FileMaker, but um, I, I like to like what what kicked it off for you? You know what what inspired you to start exploring uh, AI in FileMaker, right? And and maybe you can share some of your earlier experiences uh, in, in doing so. And I don't know, Ernest, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Yeah. So years ago, we had a pretty challenging problem with uh, a set of education related customers, and the. the 
I don't get too deep into it, but the problem basically is the question, like, how do we figure out what are our best students from an admission standpoint, whether they will enroll with us, whether they will stay with us, how do we predict that we're going to get the right people into, into enrollment? And we had a lot of data to do, to, to, uh, you know, to deal with. And so that was like the first time I got into ML as an initial exercise, which is the question of how do you predict something based on existing data, right? So from then on, I just kind of caught the bug. You know, I was like, wow, this is this is really, really cool because uh, maybe you can turn your uh, fantasy football stats into, into something <laughs> that is actually making money and, and not, you know, I'm just kind of kidding. But you you get the idea that, you know, this this inkling about what's possible in the future is really grounded in the data that you, you, you already had. Um, yeah, so that, that that's how that's how I got started. You know, Chris, I think fantasy football sounds a little yeah they, maybe they're on your alley. Would you uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about you? <laughs> that was a great pass, Ernest. Uh, nice. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, for me it was a hobby. I was trying to make FileMaker help me beat my friends and family at fantasy football, and I found out that it like I couldn't do some fundamental things. Ultimately, what I was trying to do is do some uh, ridge regression, and we can't do that natively in FileMaker. And so through those explorations, I found machine learning and ended up you know, really using that as a way to understand models, which I, I think is a great way for anybody to learn something. Just start with a hobby, something that you're close to and that you have an intimate relationship with. And after working with creating ML models, I realized, wow, this goes way beyond the hobby. This could be amazing for business. And so started building custom models, custom ML models. Then I realized uh, you don't have to build custom models for everything. There's some pre-trained models, mm -hmm. which are out in the cloud, and you can connect to them through APIs. And while I was connecting to some of those pre-trained models that did stuff like, you know, summarization, sentiment analysis, keyword extraction, all the, you know, the greatest hits... I then found another model that you could connect to through APIs, which did all of that stuff. And that was uh, OpenAI's GPT-3. And not only could it do all that stuff, but amazing stuff that can do so much more. So that, of course, brings us to today, right? It's fantastic. Yours, I know you guys, uh, I remember some of your early works, but I don't know if that was some of the others. What, what about you? What about yes, the, my first the experience was with image recognition. We had a client and uh, an, a casting agency, and he needed to do queries on images like find girls with freckles, for instance, or bearded guys with tattoos. And he spent a lot of time tagging his images. So after a photo shoot, tagging his images. And I discovered the Clarify pre-trained model at that time, 2017, mm -hmm. uh, which, has a, with, which had an excellent and very easy to use API. And so I managed to handle that image tagging uh, automatically, and I demoed it also at at some conferences at at that time. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It was uh, that was really compelling. Uh, you know, kind of very very early stages, right? When using uh, machine learning models in FileMaker. Um, uh, let's say with you here, there is um, I, obviously I think all, all of us agree that there are definitely some challenges when trying to bring you know AI into any platform, right? Uh, but uh, so, you know, in FileMaker is no exception. Um, I'd like to hear, what do you think are some of the challenges that that you see in some of the kind of the, you know, considerations maybe in, in bringing AI into your own solutions and maybe uh, tell us a little bit how might you, you might be addressing them. If I may. Um, yeah, please. It's very simple to integrate in FileMaker actually. It's simple API calls. Uh, if you're talking open AI, like Chris just did. The hardest thing for me was to learn that ChatGPT is not Google and <laughs> probabilistic versus deterministic. Uh, and right. that's mm -hmm. what I see around me also, people having wrong uh, assumptions uh, about AI, about AI being able to provide all answers where it can 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 be very wrong and, and can start hallucinating that. So that, that's a challenge, uh, tweaking the prompts and so-called prompt engineering. Mm. Chris, I see you're nodding ears. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a really important point. I, I would I'd go so far as to say if you're trying to use uh, these models as question answer machines and you're relying on them for their truth, then then you're just kind of doing it wrong. Y you can provide the answers to your questions when you're making these API calls, and that should really be what businesses are concentrating on doing, because you know, yeah, they don't get everything right. Their solution hallucinations, but 
none of those should be reasons to not be experimenting with these tools. Frankly, zero uh, percent of our deployments for our clients have to do with answering questions. So I, I think that's an excellent point that people should really be concentrating on. Yeah, I think, I think right. for me, the hardest roadblock or challenge in, in getting started or really feeling like you're getting traction with this is, mm -hmm. frankly, just access to data, you know, and 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 the mechanics of pre preparing it and getting it right and and the trial and error that it takes to get it into the right place and and the machinery, so to speak, that you need in the background to support you know, all that stuff. So if you do this in Python and any other sort of standard ML or AI um, toolkits, I mean, there's a lot of extracting and parsing and, you know, building little, you know, in-memory databases and stuff like that, or using other databases too. So you're, you're basically building a set of tools to allow you to get to your question and then before you get to your answer, right? Yeah. Um, so if you don't if you don't have those skills or that internal capacity, it just seems like you have all these little things that get in the way before you you can actually be fluent. Right? Now the cool thing about FileMaker is that you get all those things in one <laughs> one box, right? I mean, and, exactly. And, yeah, and, and that's been very cool, right? So you can do a lot of things that it would be like, oh, I got to extract this, I got to dump this out of Python, I got to run this script, you know, this this parser, I got to use PyTorch, and oh my, and on and on and on and on. I think the last mile of that was, I think, what's changed in the last couple of years, which is just the APIs to to models out there with hugging phase mm -hmm. and all that. That's really just been a game changer for for FileMaker centric you know, AI and ML and ML work. Because a lot of that can stay in FileMaker. You don't have to come leave FileMaker to do that kind of work. Yeah. Totally agree. It's what Giuliano mentioned in the opening keynote of Claris Engage that we are in a very good spot actually, because we are already very close to the data. And uh, as FileMaker developers, we are used to um, adapt uh, our knowledge and do all the jobs, not only the database part, but also the programming part and think along with the client. So we are in a very good spot uh, for AI integration. I believe that. I can agree more on that. And, you know, I, I know a lot of the people here who are listening today are, are, are uh, you know, are running their businesses, are, are using FileMaker to, to do so. Um, so I, I, I hear from people all the time that they're, um, they're wondering, well, you know, what, you know, what can I get out of AI? Let's, let's bring in AI. So I, I hear people talking about AI, but, you know, what benefits um, can I see, right? What, what would be the benefits? Uh, what are the cost implications of me bringing AI? What's the potential uh, ROI? Uh, and, and, you know, how can I be made aware of, of those things? And I'd wonder what, what, what your thoughts on, uh, on those uh, that might be. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Do, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think the easiest on-ramp or the place where most of our customers are starting with this is just unlocking data that they previously didn't have access mm -hmm. to, specifically embedding techniques where you can vectorize, store documents, and convert essentially your archives into usable data to help differentiate your business. That seems like the very first place for people to start. From there, most of our customers go to you know just sc uh, scalable tasks, like really just focusing on tasks you can scale and then make them more efficient through these processes. It gives you a chance, like any other, anytime you're adopting a new technology, you can really get back to like a first principles approach to some of even just your back office tasks. It doesn't have to be these big swings for the fences. This can just be simple, you know, getting more out of the staff that you have, giving your users superpowers and really just getting access to data that you never had before. And that's why we're all so perfectly suited for this. We're right next to the data. We already work with the data and it's just a different way of giving people access to it. And from a cost standpoint, Honestly, our observation, if we compare our AI development projects we do for clients mm -hmm. against the FileMaker ones, the AI ones take way less time and are less costly. So the ROI math just makes sense. It's fast, less expensive. And if you can scale existing inefficient functions, that naturally comes with a high upside ROI. So I think if anybody thinks these things are more complicated, uh, shockingly, they're considerably less. So uh, the risk is a lot lower and the ROI is a lot higher. Yeah, totally agree to, to add to that, uh, like classification, as I mentioned, image tagging, uh, it's very time consuming at the recruiting agency. I mentioned in my demo, uh, also they're going to save a lot of time because now they are parsing out resumes and then 
tagging job descriptions, for instance, to be able to to find him. Now with semantic search, we can we can take all that need for tagging away. It's 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 hours and hours and hours of time saved. There is a lot of low hanging fruit, right? So I think I think there's a misconception with the space today where. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation, and it's true. There's a lot of conversation about training costs around AI. It's super expensive. You look at mm -hmm. news about what Bloomberg has spent to train in new models and stuff like that. But I think that misses really the picture on the ground for most businesses that are not the Bloombergs and CNNs of the world, right? And I agree with, with yours and, and, and Chris here. The, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And if you just look around at things that are taking a long time and that require... Uh, a lot of um, um, manual effort that is undifferentiated, that those are just like ripe for, for ML slash AI work. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think it's important to separate like the training problem from the inference problem. Inference is actually pretty accessible today. And I think that the aggregate of very small wins can yield some massive results. You know, just like don't try to swing for the fences. You know, try to do something small and then make it really, uh, and and those and those effects will compound. You know, just like being able to have a chat that makes sense against your documents, and you can apply it across the organization. That alone is transformative in a way that people have a hard time imagining, and those hours just really aggregate when you when you start using it. I was also amazed at AI's capab capabilities of uh, cleaning up data. So you can just feed it a, a spreadsheet with uh, rubbish data and it will automatically suggest improvements uh, in spelling, uh, classification. Um, it writes its own Python code to do the necessary uh, data transformation operations. So that's also a huge time save. Chris, I know you had some, some experience cleaning up data with AI. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, data pre-processing is so critical, yeah. and that's not to suggest that you know we're, we we deal with structured data inside FileMaker just naturally because we're a you know relational database platform, but you know we don't get tripped up when there's uh, gaps in our data or inconsistencies. Uh, and one of the in my early experiments, I when I started working with data, I found out the first thing I could do is just say do all the pre-processing steps that are normally required in machine learning to clean this up. So, it, you know, you can ask it to make suggestions. How do I fill in these gaps? What data should I put in here? And then as it detects those patterns, it can even create more synthetic data for training purposes, you know, to, to continually keep that process going. It's really amazing, honestly. Like our FileMaker structures are very forgiving when it comes to the data quality. But, you know, when it comes to modeling, you definitely need to have clean data and AI is just the perfect tool to do that. I mean, you barely even have to know what it's doing, especially when you're doing these execution environments that have access to tool sets like uh, the Python execution environments, for example, that have, you know, uh, the the data cleaning and processing built right into their processes. Yep. I totally agree. Um, yeah, I've been playing around with, with, with some of those things there as well. And, um, you know, I myself have been playing around with with AI for a few years uh, uh, myself, and uh, a lot of it, right, to me is uh, uh, you know you've got to, you got to you got to use it, you got to try it out, and the resources uh, try to find the right resources. Um, obviously, a lot of change in the last say five years, where there's a lot more resources, really for us filmmaker developers when it comes to to AI. But um, I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, you guys what you know if you you definitely are more advanced in your AI journey than than most of us uh, out here. So if you had any advice to give to the FileMaker developers out there, right, on how to move forward in their AI journey, on bringing AI into FileMaker, uh, any recommendations, uh, training resources, where they should start, you know? Uh, uh, Chris, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, first of all, just start working with these tools. I, I would assume anybody that's attending this uh, discussion is interested. I, while I don't suggest using things like ChatGPT or Claude with your business data at work, you should use them for your own personal tasks. I, I don't think an hour goes by in my day where I'm not using one of those tools just for personal productivity purposes. I think soon we're going to start to see that type of thing being thrust upon us on our devices as our personal data is managed. And we have this real like brand new relationship with personal assistants. So lean into that as that's coming very shortly. 
and really uh, continue to sharpen your pencil on API skills. You, honest to God, that's half the, the battle. If you've yet to embark on making API calls, like uh, understanding things like insert from URL, how to uh, create a curl request or parsing J JSON and or native JSON uh, tools within FileMaker, do that, like get used to that right now, but really just be curious and experiment and see what's possible to begin with. And then from there, the obvious use cases are going to start to fall into place for you. Yeah. You're, I see you're nodding. You're... Yeah, you know, yeah. I totally agree. Um, you're already in a very good place if you're using FileMaker. Um, it's very easy to learn about API. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, my best advice will be uh, if you're still hesitating whether a paid subscription $20 a month or something for OpenAI uh, or a similar engine is worth it. For me, it's, it's one of the best 20 bucks I ever spent. No uh, doubt. In, I believe. No doubt. Uh, and another thing, learn about prompt engineering. You can ask uh, ChatGPT, for instance, like what's prompt engineering? And for instance, I learned that what, what you also mentioned, Ronnie, you can ask the AI to evaluate its own answer and improve on it or, or come up with two, three different possibilities and then pick the best possibility so you can create like a feedback loop uh, with the AI. That's some, some of the things I learned by just simply asking ChatGPT about prompt engineering. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll go towards sort of the, the most psychological aspect of this since you know, Chris and, and yours has covered like the, the, the absolutely correct baselines, just get started. But I think the one thing I noticed for myself is just like getting over fear, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this idea that, well, AI is going to replace us. So um, I, I'm predisposed to not trust it. And I want a story in my head about how they'll never replace me as a developer. Or I'm a better programmer. They'll never get it right. I think once you lean in, you'll be surprised by how different that world is when you treat it like a companion an extender mm -hmm. of your, your brain. And it just changes the way you think about what's valuable. Right? I think that's really the first step. And not just for you, for your entire team and mm -hmm. start your business. You know, and I think just getting that abundance mindset as a starting point and saying, yes, we will have to change some assumptions about what we think is important, what kind of work mm -hmm. is important. Um, and then and being prepared to make changes to adapt to it. Uh, I think you'll be surprised by how liberating um, the stuff is, you know, getting started. Uh, I'd like to, to kind of talk a little bit more about something that you mentioned there, right? I, I, I hear that as well from, from developers I talk to, uh, how there, you know, there's some fear, but hey, is it going to replace uh, developers and, you know, is my job going to go away? And um, my experience, however, I'd like to hear what, what, you, uh, what you have to say, but my experience is, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Like it, it does. It's not magic. It, it doesn't just happen. Uh, it doesn't just spit out the right thing. There's a lot of pre-processing. There's a lot of data cleanup. There's a lot of stitching together. You know, there's a lot of uh, still a lot of coding to get everything right and to make sure the, the things everything aligns. Um, and so, you know, my personal opinion is that we're <laughs> we still have a job for quite uh, for quite some time, even if our job description changes, right? If, if the things that we do might be a little bit different, but I'd like to hear your perspective and uh, Ernest, since you were talking about it, uh, what, what do you think about it? I, th again, I, I think it's, it's an abundance mindset, but I think it's rooted in, in some truths, right? It's not just like wishful thinking that things are going to be just naturally expansive and therefore we don't have anything to, to worry about. Um, and what I mean by that is this, if you're an artist today and your entire value proposition is predicated on how well you draw lines on paper, uh, you're going to be in trouble because there are lots of ways to do that better than you could ever do by, by yourself, right? So the value proposition an artist brings to their craft is not the ability to necessarily draw lines. It's about conceptualizing, having an idea, differentiating a, a vision, executing on that, pulling all, you know, the, the, the knowledge and, and, and ideas from, from, from their experience into, into their art. And, and the execution part is not unimportant, but it's not the most important part of that work. 
And this seems obvious. Like we don't measure an artist by the paintbrushes they use or the colors that they buy from, from the store, right? So I think in, in, in programming land, it's sort of the same thing. You know, for, for me, I think the way I'm thinking about this is like, yes, coding is important. Programming is important, but it's not the most important thing we do, right? The most important thing we do is all the other things. It's the ideation, it's the design, it's the understanding of the business problem. It's pulling all that together and having the experience and, and domain knowledge to integrate both the experience and the intersection of experience and 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 models and signs and 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 you know and, and solutioning to really produce something. You know, so we have to expand the definition of programming. The the number of things you type on screen is not the most valuable thing, right? Generating is the least important aspect of what we do. It's not unimportant, but it's the least important aspect of what we do. So I think if if we do that and we have a more expansive way of thinking about the value we bring to the world, mm -hmm. then yeah, AI is not a threat. It's just an enhancer. You know? Just one quote from Steve Jobs that comes to my mind, like a computer is a bicycle for the mind. And then AI is probably the rocket ship. I don't know, but the liberating aspect of it, that's what I like in Ernst's uh, yeah. vision. That's how I feel it. Um, one example, I found a stupid batch script on a server, three pages long. What does this script do? And normally I would spend like one hour of edge scratching, figuring out what this script is. And, and that's not something I like to do. It's It's... And now I feed this to an AI and it tells me in two seconds, like, oh, this is just uh, a backup schedule. And uh, yeah, I know I could remove it. So it, it helps it helps me a lot in my day-to-day -day job and my team. Uh, so we are already working much faster than uh, before. I think that if we're, we really take a first principles approach to what it is that we all do, we're problem solvers, right? You know, uh, mm -hmm. Claris put that moniker on us a couple of dev cons ago. But if you really break that down, what our job really is, is to go from the moment that a client realizes that they have a problem, which we're not even in the room when that happens, right? So there's all these steps that happen between them going, ooh, we have to solve this whatever problem. They finally find Claris and a partner and whatever. By the time we get to it, you know, time grass has already grown under that problem. So the quicker that we can get to the solution from the moment the quicker we can deliver a solution from the inception of when the problem was recognized is really what our true responsibility is. And what these, what AI is going to allow us to do, not just from a developer tool enhancement, but the way that people have a relationship with their existing data, it's going to greatly enhance what our abilities to accomplish, or what we're able to accomplish within a given day, for example, right? So, um, you know, we people aren't going away. It's just our expectations of what we're able to produce and in a certain amount of time is going to greatly in increase and it's continued it's likely going to continue to do that exponentially. But that's great for our customers because the ideal would be a customer has a problem, the thought bubble pops up, and all of a sudden the solution appears right in front of them. That seems a little space age at the moment, but this closer we can get to that by leveraging models on the data side and on the coding and, and programming side, the the better it's going to be for our customers. At the end of the day, that's why we get up every morning. That's what our responsibility is here. So I, I think that's extremely hopeful. In some ways, this harkens back to the core promise of FileMaker. Right? I mean, this is exactly how we all got into this. Mm -hmm. We picked a tool that takes away all the BS stuff that we had to do to make something work. You know, I mean, I remember programming websites from in the early days in the, in the, in the late 90s where you start with not just file new, you start with like literally file new blank and you start typing, yeah. you know, like a first Perl command into thing. And, and so, so, you know, in a lot of ways, we all come from a subject matter domain expertise kind of background. We have a problem in our heads and we need a tool to, to let us just express the solution to that problem in as fast and quick and as natural a fashion as possible. And I just see this as an extension of it, you know. I want to give enough time to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, but before we do, I have a little surprise for you. Um, we, I thought we could not have a discussion about AI without giving AI the opportunity to ask a question here <laughs> as well. So I went through a little process. I took, I'm a huge proponent of uh, open source and commercial uh, models as well. And I believe in the aggregate or the, uh, the average being more accurate than a single reading. So I took about 10 different models and I, Gave them enough information about this session, some background on each one of our panelists, and 
asked that literally, if you could ask this panel one question, what would it be? And so I took the answers of all of these models and then fed it back to them, uh, anonymized, and asked them to choose one question. So mm. I'm going to ask you the one question that all these models voted on and decided was the most intriguing, most interesting question to ask you all today. So, wow, ready? All right. <laughs> Great. All right. So the question is, and I'll read it verbatim because they, they created it. So it's uh, AI and machine learning technologies like large language models are rapidly evolving. As FileMaker developers, what excites you the most about the potential of integrating AI capabilities into custom apps over the next few years? What kind of powerful new features and functionality do you envision being able to build into FileMaker solutions by leveraging AI? And how do you see that empowering businesses and teams to work in smarter, more productive ways? All right, yours, we'll start with you. Okay, great. Um, well, I play music as a hobby and um, finding patterns in sounds is something that's very appealing and, and that's, that's becoming reality uh, very soon, I believe. Um, so like having a tune in your head and then finding similar songs, something like that, or, or uh, like having the beginning of a song, completing a song, things like that. Um, also, AI is moving rapidly towards content creation, movies and games and all that stuff. And it excites me and scares me at the same time, uh, <laughs> because we will probably, what I believe AI cannot provide is originality. It will, AI will never generate a new Picasso, will never, that's what I believe, because it's a statistical model, it can just build on what it has been fed in. And I believe that's still a human aspect. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited about AI getting more senses, like not only text, but also images, movies, sound, uh, maybe smells, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Ernest, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, You're there's a lot about? there. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're just getting started. You know, I think the intersection of spatial and AI is going to be profound. Um, and it's this thing that Yoris alluded to. I mean, I mean, a lot of our world is sort of one-dimensional, two-dimensional right now. Text or pictures. Once we get AI on devices on compute and small enough and cheap enough access level, and that will come, you know, your phone or your watch will have a full model, not just a large language model, but a multimodal you know, model that can understand the world in a way that, that, that is approximate to how we as humans can understand the world, or at least process the world if not fully understand it. Um, and, and then I think, when you can do things in our space that you can't even imagine today, I mean, just like basic assumptions about what an application is just probably doesn't matter. Right? It's like you're solving the problem, not with an interface you're solving a problem with something else, you know, some, some, some fully spatial multimodal experience that we, we are just starting to, to explore. And that, that's what I'm excited about, you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, definitely the future, well, first of all, it's impossible to predict the future of AI. So I'll just keep my answer limited to, let's just say the rest of 2024. Um, <laughs> well, beyond 2024, certainly, you know, adding symbolic models and worldview models to mm -hmm. embellish what language models can do is really what the future is going to dictate. But just focusing on this year, I would say specifically long context uh, windows, we're uh, already been working with 1 million token windows and it is absolutely game changing. Mm -hmm. I already have customer use cases for te the 10 million token windows, which will be here by the end of the year. That is a pretty significant paradigm shift in how we're collecting and sending data. Um, meaning like more isn't always better. It's still going to be about a data quality, but long context window is going to absolutely just like blow up like what we're already doing with businesses and AI right now. The other thing that exists and kind of popped up last year, but is going to continue to mature and, and take a, a more front burner approach is uh, agents, uh, where we move towards a less heuristic uh, and more of a like a system two approach, 
with the proliferation of these agents and even model pairing and, and having multiple models involved. Those tools are already available to us today, but uh, it's it's becoming more and more clear that more of what our customers are needing are, are involve those types of system two approaches. So um, that's what I think I will see happen by the end of the year. And it's just crazy to think that because that that's those are radically different than this like zero shot type you know mm -hmm. uh, heuristic relationship that we have with or system one relationship that we have with the AI models right now. So um, can't wait. I mean, it's it, it's hard it's hard to keep up with, but it's exciting at the same time. So um, very very yeah. much look forward to seeing what everybody in the community does with AI integrations, what customers start asking for, and gosh, we have a conversation like this a year from now. It's just going to seem like what ten years went by. <laughs> totally agree. All right. Uh, so with that, again, let's uh, we'll give the audience an opportunity to ask questions to the panel. So uh, we'll switch over here and uh, fill out some of the questions that have been uh, coming in. The questions and uh, Ernest, yours, uh, Chris, and I have been trying to field them as they've been coming in. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, one of the product managers here at Claris, and I've had the privilege to work with Ronnie and team on some of our AI enhancements. Um, so to kick us off, a couple of uh, uh, easy ones. Yuris, there's a, quite a demand for your uh, card reader demo. If you could post the link to that in the, um, in the Q and A section, I think people would appreciate that. Uh, second thing I wanted to call out, uh, there was a lot of questions around sort of more details and depth in the demos that you saw from the group. Uh, all of their sessions, uh, each one hosted a session at Engage this year, uh, those will be made available today. Uh, Beverly has actually, thank you Beverly, posted links to those videos. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll have a QR code for our community uh, that, that will link you to and we'll make sure that those resources are there as well. Cool. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I'll take, uh, and then I've got uh, a couple for each of you. Um, first, there was one around, you know, is there plans on us integrating directly with OpenAI natively? And I want to address that question from a sort of philosophically how we're thinking about this. Uh, so we're not making any plans to tie to any third party provider model. Um, and that's because we believe that one, there's a lot of competition amongst these models, which is good for us. Uh, every day there's uh, a new announcement of how one model can do something better than another. Um, and so giving you the flexibility and freedom to uh, choose the model that works both best for the situation and your data security needs um, is important. So what you'll see from us is uh, improvements on how to integrate with those models, um, but not necessarily things where we're tying directly to something like OpenAI. Um, the last thing I'll say there is that, because uh, it sort of touches on another question I was seeing about you know choosing the right model, um, and, and maybe to the group, if you have any thoughts to expand on this, um, you know, choosing the right model, what I've seen often happen is, you know, you might start with something like OpenAI's models or uh, Anthropic's models, uh, just because there's such a, they have such broad uh, coverage to prove that, you know, a specific need that you have is doable. Uh, but once you've sort of a, a said, yeah, we've built a proof of concept, yes, it's doable, then you start thinking about what are my security needs, what are my cost needs, what are my performance needs, and that's where you start really narrowing down to some models that are much smaller, much more uh, uh, tuned to that specific use case. Um, so that's yet another reason why, you know, tying to a specific model doesn't make sense for us. Uh, the panel, though, anything to add to that or, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say I think it's it it to say as kind of a thought experiment. There are some workflows that might actually require multiple different models. Like mm -hmm. so, for example, you could have some agents running in the back end that are uh, generating code, and then when you encounter an error, you might want to pass that off to like a code model, like a you know Llama code or a Copilot or something like that. So you might be pairing models in the background. So just kind of assuming that you just want to go to one source means you're really only connecting to one tool set. Uh, you know, like in my experience, uh, when we go to Claude Opus API, it's better for summarization and next step type stuff than maybe GPT-4 is. So you can have, you should have the right model for the right job. And that requires understanding what the models do, uh, what they, you know, what's which ones are better at others, which ones were trained for specific tasks. And then frankly, you know, you, I think you mentioned something really important, uh, also being aware 
aware of open source models and their capabilities so that you can actually bring these models behind your wall and do those API calls securely without having to expose your, your business data uh, in these business use cases. So in those cases, there are so many models, like literally weekly, we, we do these meetings here where we just do what's new in AI in a week. We should probably do it twice a week. But we go through the leaderboards. There are these leaderboards. You can go on Hugging Face and see all the different models, like the open source ones, uh, closed models. Uh, there's a, a ton of different embeddings models. There's not just one embeddings model. So really making yourself aware of what's out there, what which ones are better at certain tasks, will allow you to map those into the work, workflows appropriately. Beautiful. Um, so sort of related to this, um, and, and I know Ernest, you touched on uh, cost a little bit during the presentation, but I saw a few questions around just, you know, how, how do you anticipate um, the overall cost of the solutions that you, you've built? We, we saw some examples from you today. Um, what was your sort of process for identifying, okay, yeah, maybe this is technically, but what considerations do I need to think about as I put this into scale? Um, and, you know, obviously open source models as part of that, but for any one of you, they could speak to sort of how you calculate those costs up front. It depends on the models you're going, going to use and whether you're hosting them yourself or if you're using, um, obviously, open AI or, or Entropic or anything of the, you know, any of the hosted models that are out there, right? Um, maintaining a server to run, you know, and to host an LLM can get pricey depending on how large a model you need to you need to host. So it all depends, you know. But but then again, you don't have to host very large models and keep it highly available all the time, right? So for a lot of things that you might be thinking, what is vector embeddings and whatnot, it could be you know do some work, get done, shut it down, and turn it back on, and and that sort of thing. Um, so cost is definitely a factor, but it, it, we are still magnitude smaller than training. You know, if you're talking about training new models, then yeah, that that's a pretty expensive proposition, right? And the good news is almost no one in our community will ever have to train a model. That's a really, really tiny sliver of the community out there that needs to do that. Fine tuning, honestly, that might be a term you hear thrown around. It has been our experience that fine tuning is, we just don't handle enough data in an average FileMaker application that you can actually move the needle on a fine tuning a model. So really the retrieval techniques, that's probably the biggest takeaway is just don't worry about fine tuning right now. That's where all the compute costs come and that's actually extremely expensive to host anyways. Focus on retrieval because then you're dealing with small bits of data that are relevant and you're providing your own truth and not relying on the models for truth. That is really where all of us that are doing work for businesses should be focusing in the near term as far as exploring what's possible with the language models. I agree. And retrieval cost is measured in tokens. You pay by the token. And so different models like GPT 3.5 is cheaper than GPT 4, for instance. So you can pretty accurately estimate how much a certain amount of words or tokens uh, will cost you. So if you want to vectorize text, like Ernst showed, uh, you can measure how, how much words you have in your text and that will more or less correspond with the number of tokens being used and you can estimate the cost in that way. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, Chris, you're probably the best fit for this because I think the questions that come out of your presentation are at Core ML. Um, and, and there was a number of questions just around, uh, really it boils down to where to get more information. Um, I, I will say again, you know, we've got a community thread and, and I'm hoping that that becomes a place, a repository for the group to be sharing information. Um, but in a couple of minutes, is there, you know, a, a, uh, any direction that you can give folks that are looking to learn more in that area? On the core ML, I did my best to try to put a uh, YouTube link into chat, um, but on the Claris, I did a, I, I think I did, at least there's one of them on using the create ML tool that I used in my demo to create uh, image models. This goes back to actually Robert, you and I were talking about that demo that you did in Orlando on training image models, but there's also ways you can use that to create text-based models. That way that you can use the general option in the um, in the supported uh, script steps within FileMaker. That's what I was using. So, um, you know, like regression-based models, like the one I showed is a text, or a, referred to as a general model inside FileMaker script steps. 
I would strongly recommend try getting to know them using images because images are easy and it's fun to train on and you can do image recognition and it's kind of cool and satisfying and then move into uh, data uh, training of those models and create is a great tool for that, honestly. Um, because it outputs in a file that we store in a container field in FileMaker and those .ml model files are actually can be run within a FileMaker session. So I think that's why it's so close to us in FileMaker world. Love it. Uh, awesome, Chris. Thank you. And um, we're putting up now a QR code. I mentioned it earlier. Th this is where we have a dedicated section in the community to con continue these AI discussions. Some of the questions that I was trying to field uh, as the session was going on, I, I recommended people go there so we could pick up those conversations. The resources that we're identifying here, we'll be making sure that we post those as well. Um, and I just want to thank the panel for the awesome discussion for everyone that was able to join this morning. The excitement that we're seeing around this uh, is infectious. <laughs> um, this is something that you know we've been talking about, uh, keeping an eye on over the last couple of years and to see the momentum that's building is really exciting. So thank you all for your time today. We'll post the re this recording up later today for folks to go back. And I saw some uh, needs to go frame by frame on some of the demos. So I look forward to that for everyone as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.